hopefully listen. So welcome to today's Tuesday topic, some top points for glycemic control. Um, I, can you hear me, everybody? Yes, okay, good. Um, so I wanna be sure that we all appreciate how dangerous insulin is. And I think historically we've treated with very cavalier attitudes. We don't really worry that much about our patients who are on insulin. What we, what we think about is that, oh, this is simple. It's a hormone. It's okay. I'm going to adjust it to meet my patient's blood sugar, and I'm not going to worry too, too much. But that's one of the most important things for us to think about is to really appreciate glycemic management, why we use it. So I, I use this slide a lot. I just want to remind you that we have really three basic categories of hyperglycemia that we treat in critical illness. We treat type 1s. Those are typically patients with high hemoglobin A1C who present to us in ketosis with hyperglycemia. We treat type, and type ones basically have an absolute insulin deficiency. We also treat type twos, and type twos pretty much cover, in, in terms of practice, covers everybody else who is hyperglycemic, but who don't have ketosis. So the prevalence for that is the type two diabetic, but you may also see that in type ones. Now, what you want to remember is that type two diabetics typically have a loss of responsiveness of their receptor site. Okay. Loss of responsiveness of the receptor site, but they have adequate insulin. So remember that the role of insulin is to unlock the receptor and allow glucose to be transported to the cell. So type 2 type two diabetics typically don't have enough receptor sites, but they have insulin. And type 1 diabetics have receptor sites, but they don't have insulin. So that's a really important concept for us to appreciate and understand how our patients present understanding that typical category of type one and type two, and that type one means hyperglycemia with ketosis, and type two is all other hyperglycemia, not necessarily in crisis, but all other hyperglycemia. So really important for us to appreciate that uh, when we're evaluating our patients. And here you see kind of this same thing that we looked at already. So I want to make sure, and I hope I've included everybody here, that our first group of patients that we see and we are going to uh, generate glycemic management on are the ones that you think about traditionally. And those are people who are hyperglycemic, who are spilling glucose in the urine, and who have ketones. And we're going to evaluate their ketosis by the wide anion gap. Remember what anion gap is, is it looks at positively charged particles and negatively charged particles and the difference between the two. What we measure typically is sodium for the positive and bicarbon chloride for the negative. But to remember that when we have, particularly when we have ketosis from diabetes, you will also be releasing metabolic acid, that's hydrogen, and that makes your gap wide. So any gap greater than 14 in the presence of hyperglycemia, we're going to consider to be DKA. But a lot of our patients, and actually in more prevalence in critical care, are patients who are hyperglycemic and gly glycosuric who do not have ketones. So this is going to be type 2, and very commonly you're going to see a type 2 diabetic who has really high glucose and who are very dehydrated. High glucose, dehydrated, often presenting in what we call hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. But that's not the only person. That's anybody who has hyperglycemia without ketosis. Okay. A third category, and it's one that most of us don't recognize very much. I hope that I'll be able to help you understand that a little bit here are patients who have ketone, ketonemia and therefore wide gap and acidosis, but they are 
euglycemic. So their glucose is normal, but they have ketosis. Now these patients are tricky. They are really tricky because you want to start stop their ketosis. And in this case, it must be ketoacidosis. So first of all, you've got a wide gap. Secondly, you have to look at beta hydroxy, which is the keto the ketone that we measure. You must have a beta hydroxy, you must have a wide gap, but your glucose is normal. Now I need you to stop ketosis. So what I'm going to do for you, because you have ketosis, is I'm going to give you insulin, but because you're euglycemic, I also must give you a glucose store. And typically that's going to be D10, generally around 150 an hour. Because what I want to stop is your ketosis, but I have to actually give you glucose to match the insulin so that I don't make you worse. Because I will make you worse if I don't match your insulin with carbohydrates. Some young adults will waste glucose in the urine, but their serum glucose is normal and that's self-limiting. For the majority of our patients, we are making the primary diagnosis by looking at point of care glucose. So these patients, you're only trying to figure out why they're making so much urine. And when you look at their urine, you see that they have high degree of glucose in the urine, but their serum glucose is normal. That's not the most common patient we see. We see DKA, profound hyperglycemia, and euglycemic ketosis. That's the most common patient that you're going to see. So very important for us to appreciate that in terms of using continuous insulin. Now here at Grady, we have a methodology. It's an external web-based um, management tool. Fantastic for us. We just do really great with it. But a talk for everyone is to remind yourself, no matter whether you have a methodology or a paper protocol or a physician who's ordering insulin, you actually have to remember that in DKA, your number one focus is on ketosis. Number one, you want to stop ketosis. So hyperglycemia is secondary. Ketosis is primary. That means that when your patient's blood sugar drops less than 250, you have to add in a glucose store. So that may be D5LR at 150 an hour. It may be D10 at 75 or 150 an hour. That's all based on the protocol in the institution which you work. Our protocol is D5LR 150 an hour for glucose less than 250, but greater than 150. And if you're less than 150, you go on D10 at 150 an hour. Now that protocol is changing, still have to give carbohydrates. It's a little protocol change for us, but in your own institution, you need to be prepared to give your patient glucose to raise their glucose level until you stop ketosis. Once ketosis is gone, you should no longer be treating that patient with continuous IV insulin. They should transition now to long acting insulin and intermittent sliding scale, either meal based or three times a day. You'll decide that with your provider. But the reason to keep a patient on continuous insulin is if they have ketosis, either hyperglycemic ketosis or euglycemic ketosis, you keep them on continuous IV insulin until you obliterate the ketosis. And at that point, remember, your patient may have dropped their blood sugar. You must make them hyperglycemic or more glycemic so that you can match glucose to insulin and you can obliterate ketosis. That is your goal. That is your goal. With all other hyperglycemias, that means any hyperglycemia that does not have ketosis. Your number one concern is get that glucose under control. You're not worried about ketones because the patient doesn't have ketosis. They may have a wide gap, but that's from lactic acidosis. How did we know that? Because we looked at your beta hydroxy uh, level and that was normal. So that's really, really important for us to appreciate. You've got a wide gap, that's because you've almost urinated yourself to death and you're profoundly hypovolemic. So your focus here is to get the glucose under control and give the patient volume. 
Over here, when you have ketosis, it's get the ketosis under control, control the glucose. You can give volume and you may need to give your patient a D5 or D10 source in order to bring that glucose up to match with the insulin that you're giving. Now, most people find that to be crazy making, but here's the reason they think it's crazy making because they don't understand the purpose. If your patient has ketosis and you don't give them glucose while you're giving them insulin, you will make their ketose, ketosis worse. You will make them worse. You do not want to make patients worse. You want to make them better. So we have to be very clear about these principles when we're talking about our patients. Everybody, everybody who is on continuous IV insulin, everybody needs a continuous carbohydrate source. So here at Grady, that is 40 mLs per hour D5 LR or D5 normal if you do not have ketosis. If you have ketosis, when your blood sugar drops below 250, you get D5 LR at 150 an hour. If your blood glucose is less than 150, you're gonna deliver D10 at 150 an hour. Now that seems a little bit crazy for me. So I have requested in our glucose protocol that you, whenever your blood glucose less than 250, it's not in the protocol yet, you will deliver a D10 at 75 an hour. And whenever blood glucose is less than 150, you'll deliver D10 at 150 an hour. But currently this is what we're doing here at Grady in our protocol. Now I wanna make sure everyone appreciates that when you have ketosis, our goal with insulin is to stop your ketosis. So you must have two things. You must have positive ketones and you must have a wide anion gap, okay? So alcohol ketoacidosis, starvation ketoacidosis, you have high ketones, but typically you don't have acidosis. So that's the way we're gonna differentiate. You must have positive beta hydroxys, you must have acidosis. Okay, and that's the way we're going to differentiate. Those patients, even if their blood glucose is 140, are going to go on insulin and you as the nurse are going to be sure that embedded in your protocol is a glucose source for those patients. Now, it's really important for us to remember the value of hemoglobin A1C. I'm going to remind you that this is really the way that we're going to make a good diagnosis about patients and how we're going to evaluate their, their diabetic management. If they're already diagnosed as diabetics, how we evaluate their diabetic management. So all of us on this call, unless we're known diabetics, we should always have a hemoglobin A1C value really of less than 5.5. My last one was 4.1. Now I eat a re really low carbohydrate diet unless uh, occasionally I'll just say I've got to have I've got to have some gluten-free bread or gluten-free pasta or gluten-free cookies. Uh, but and that's really carbohydrate rich, more carbohydrate rich than regular cookies or anything because it's made with all sorts of stuff that make it taste like a cookie or bread. But overall my last hemoglobin A1C is 4.2. Now if the patient has a hemoglobin A1C between 5.5 and 6.4, that means that they have a prodrome. That prodrome means that they have impaired glucose tolerance. They don't really have diabetes yet, but they're headed that way. This is typically treated with diet only, okay? If the hemoglobin A1C is greater than the 6.5, they actually are now diagnosed with diabetes. Okay, so the importance of hemoglobin A1C is this. There are three cell groups, three organ groups in the human body that take up excess glucose without the benefit of insulin. That means every time you're hyperglycemic, three organ groups take up that glucose without insulin. Cerebral, cardiac, hemopoietic, which is white cell and red cell. So why we do a blood evaluation is this is an easy way for us to evaluate how glycosylated your hemoglobin are, which tells us how often and frequently and continuously the patient is hyperglycemic. That's why we use the hemoglobin A1C. In general, my friends, I don't think you should be starting patients on continuous IV insulin without a hemoglobin A1C. 
Now it's a default at Grady, it's a default in the DKA protocol. It is not a default in the non-DKA protocol, but you should be asking for that as the bedside nurse. Just want to have a hemoglobin A1C so I, uh, I have an idea of the history for the patient. Oh, you just did a hemoglobin A1C and your patient's hemoglobin A1C is 15. That tells you that this is a diabetic patient way out of control, and you may have some struggles controlling their glucose and their ketones. So it just lets you know about that information. Okay. And I just want to remind you about evaluating blood ketones. We don't look at urine ketones anymore. We look at blood ketones. It takes time to clear ketones out of the blood, which is why what we're really evaluating on a, on a daily basis is your anion gap, because once your acidosis clears, then you've cleared your ketones. That's why we use the anion gap. Patient may still have some ketones in the blood, but they're no longer acidotic. So I wanna remind you that ketone elevation by itself may not be a causative relationship for insulin management. We look at ketone elevation plus acidosis. We evaluate acidosis with the anion gap. You don't need a blood gas. We're just gonna look at your chemistry profile for an anion gap. Normal blood ketones less than 0.6, Mild elevation, 0.6 to 1.5. Probably for that patient, I'm just going to give them some volume. But when I get to a moderate elevation, so that's your beta hydroxy, 1.5 to 3.0, you've got to go on insulin. And significant elevation usually is greater than three. That's likely DKA or alcoholic ketoacidosis. But this patient typically is not going to have a really wide anion gap. If they have one, it's going to be less than 20. So really, really important as a bedside nurse that I understand this, that I'm evaluating it, that I'm titrating my blood, my insulin to manage what's really important. Okay, so let's take a look at this patient, 28-year-old man found on the floor by his mother, soaked in urine with reduced consciousness. He'd not eaten for five days because he was trying to commit suicide. He was hallucinating, he was schizophrenic with paranoid delusions. And he took a overdose about 10 days prior with 100 Advil tablets. He's vomited once, but he says he doesn't have a cough or his mother says he doesn't have a cough. He kind of answers questions, but not really. He's not breathless. He doesn't have chest discomfort. And again, he has very severe depression, deliberate self-harm, not taking any regular meds and not taking any recreational drugs or alcohol. So first evaluation of the patient, although I would tell you neurologically, I don't think he's normal because he has a reduced consciousness. He gets a venous blood gas and on venous blood sample is pH of 7.25. Well, remember normal venous blood gas, 7.32 to 7.42 is your normal pH. So he indeed is acidotic. His CO2 is 37. So this is not a respiratory acidosis. His lactate is 1.4, but his bicarb is 16. So remember when bicarb's down, metabolic acid is up if your pH is acidotic. So you've got a metabolic acidosis and because he hasn't eaten and he hasn't provided himself with any glucose stores, his glucose is down, but he's in profound ketosis. He's in severe ketotic hypoglycemic ketosis. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna give him an AMPA D50 and we're gonna start him on an insulin drip and we're gonna measure his blood glucose 15 minutes after the AMPA D50 and 30 minutes after the AMPA D50. And we're gonna start him based on what his blood glucose is 30 minutes after the AMPA D50. We're gonna start him on continuous IV insulin and a continuous glucose source. Otherwise, he's gonna go down the tubes, might die under your care because we didn't do the right thing. So that's a really important case study. This is patient number two, another patient with an overdose prior, four days prior to admission of 80 codamol, and that's really a European paracetamol type medication. Not sure where she got it. She had an argument with her partner. She tried to commit suicide. Paramedics saw her then. They said, well, 
she's okay. She's really a low risk. I'm not going to bring her to the hospital, but she's been feeling kind of bad since then with ongoing nausea and vomiting. And she hasn't eaten or drinking for three days. So you know what's going to happen in this patient. She has a uh, history of alcohol excess, but she hasn't had any alcohol for four days. So her history includes anxiety, severe depression, alcohol excess, and her regular medication includes propranolol for anxiety. Okay. Nice normal examination. She's awake. She's alert. Venus sample. Again, she has metabolic acidosis. Her PCO2 is 27. So that's not respiratory. Her lactate is low, but her bicarb is low, which means her metabolic acid is up because her pH is low. And she has a glucose of 120 and ketones of 4.3. So for this patient, we're not going to give her an AMPA D50. We're going to start her on insulin. And at the same time, we're going to, at our, at our place, we would start her on D10 at 150 an hour, and we would start her on insulin. So understand the philosophy here is that your nice, normal glucose, you cannot start on insulin when your glucose is normal without a glucose support. And in this case, because she has DKA, it's euglycemic, we're going to start her on insulin for her ketosis, and we're going to maintain her glucose level with D10. Okay, so in type 1 diabetics, so incredibly important to remember, absence of insulin means that they have a uh, 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 an anabolic event that's continuous. They're always, in, especially in stress, in lipolysis, glycogenolysis, and gluconeogenesis. So these three hormones, not insulin, these three hormones abound to actually make more glucose available for the patient. Now, what that means to us is that because they're in lipolysis, they're going to have ketones. They're going to be ketoacidotic. So that's why this whole perspective of presence of ketones or not, not just the gap, because you could have a wide gap because you're hypovolemic and you have high lactic acid levels and other kinds of problems. Okay. And then we look at glycogenolysis, meaning you broke down any stored glucose you had, but type ones don't have much. And gluconeogenesis, which is what's occurring with lipolysis and proteolysis to actually make more glucose available. Now, lipolysis, you're going to make some glucose available, but most significantly, you're going to have an increase in your ketones. Okay. So that reminds us again, okay that we always need, especially if you're in the emergency department, to differentiate ketosis, okay? Diabetic ketoacidosis, inadequate insulin, and the patient may be euglycemic because of the SGLT2 inhibitors like Ozempic and Jardians. Those patients who are taking those meds at home may have euglycemia, but be profoundly ketotic. Starvation ketoacidosis, typically because of prolonged starvation, we're going to look at some comparative analysis in a minute. Alcoholic ketoacidosis is starvation along with an alcohol binge. So the mechanism is really similar in all three of these. The difference will be how significant your acidosis is. So you have ketoacid, but that's a type 1 ketoacid starvation. In alcoholic ketoacidosis, that's a type 2 ketone in alcoholic ketoacidosis, that means you have very little acidotic components in starvation and alcoholic, but in diabetic ketoacidosis, it's type three, and that's the beta hydroxy. That's the major contributor of metabolic acid, which is what causes you to have a wide anion gap and to be profoundly acidotic. So really important to remember, all ketosis states share that typically they have reduced insulin and an increased breakdown in protein and fat, and that they have a high level of circulating glucon, glucagon, which then promotes a reduction in your proteins and your fats. So with patients who do not have adequate insulin, that's going to be the DKA patient, in those patients, glucagon is ruling and then you diagnose them because they are breaking down proteins and fats. So their BUN goes up, their beta hydroxy goes up, 
and they have a wide anion gap. That will be consistent for DKA. Got to have that increase in beta, beta hydroxy. Then I just want to remind you about that other patient, the euglycemic DKA patient. Typically, their glucose is less than 250. It can be very low. Their pH is acidotic. They have a low bicarb. They have high beta hydroxys, and they have a wide gap. Now, that says greater than 10, but really, it will be greater than 15. Usually, it's even greater than 20, okay? But the blood glucose is relatively normal. So that's really important because by the way, all of these drugs, lots of our patients are on Farsica, a lot of our patients are on Jardians, and the one that's not up here is Ozempic. So Farsica, Jardians, Ozempic, all of those agents, can actually promote euglycemia. And if you have euglycemia and you're a type one diabetic, you then will frequently present with ketosis or ketoacidosis. Okay, so those drugs are in this category, SGLT2 inhibitors. Okay, just remember those new agents, Jardians, Farsiga, Ozempic. When your patients come in, if they're on those agents, you need to be aware that they may have normal glucose, but when we do a beta hydroxy and an anion gap, they'll have a high beta hydroxy and a wide anion gap because they are in ketoacidosis. And if you do not put them on insulin with glucose support, they will basically, they will basically die. They will eat their fat and protein to continuously try to make glucose. You put them on insulin without glucose store, that will kill them. So really, really, really important, okay? They're gonna have positive beta hydroxy. They're going to have acidosis. And typically they have a history. And by the way, you don't know the history you get a hemoglobin A1C. And remember, if that A1C is greater than 6.5, and here at Grady, the highest one I've ever seen was 19. I don't even know how that person was walking around, but they're so profoundly hyperglycemic. So you get that hemoglobin A1C to really help you understand what the history of that patient is. So in type one diabetics, who are in critical illness, who have an acute event. They have pneumonia, they have a UTI, they have an infected wound, they stepped on a piece of glass and it's now infected, or they aren't eating or they're not monitoring their glucose appropriately, they frequently will enter and be transitioned into the hospital in DKA. Okay, so that is a really, really important perspective. I love this slide, but it talks a lot about what we do to teach patients who are going home. But what I want you to remember is anybody who's a type one in crisis is at risk for DKA, okay? And remember for DKA, we're gonna control your ketosis with insulin and we're gonna elevate your blood sugar to match the insulin until ketosis disappears, at which point, you need to call your provider. I don't care if it's the middle of the night. You need to call your provider and say the gap is narrowed, the ketosis, the by gap, by gap, the acidosis has disappeared. We need to transition this patient off of continuous IV insulin for DKA. Because when you have somebody on a DKA protocol, you are actually monitoring them and giving them glucose to match their insulin. Once ketosis is gone, you're only going to monitor their glucose. So they can transition to long acting sliding scale, or they can transition to a non DKA drip, which just means a constant source of glucose, typically D5LR or D5 normal at 40 an hour. That's universal worldwide patients on continuous IV insulin. Once they go to Levomir, they need to be getting glucose support. And that will either be by tube feed D5 or by eating, okay? Type two diabetics, 
Some, many of these patients do not, have, uh, do not have much insulin or they have a failure of their insulin receptors. So this isn't really about whether you have insulin, but do you have failure of insulin receptors? So they have, can have insulin deficiency or failure of their insulin receptors, okay? Now, if we put them on insulin, they're gonna go into DKA. They can't, I'm, I'm sorry, they can go into DKA. So we always need to be very clear about that with these patients. They're not in DKA when we start. We need to actually, we as bedside nurses need to start evaluating. Once that patient gets to target, whatever your target is at your hospital, here at Grady, the target for everyone is 140 to 180. Once they get to target, you should be transitioning them and immediately. Once they get to target, you should be transitioning them. So you're using a low level of continuous insulin, they're at target. Why do you want to keep them on a drip? Why do your doctors want to keep them on a drip? They need to transition. We were dealing with them in their urgency and emergency. They don't have ketosis. So let's get them off insulin as soon as possible. And we need to do that. Okay, so this is a non-diabetic patient who has increased, uh, has hyperglycemia, but this might also be somebody who is really thin, who's working out, doing exercise. They're breaking down some muscles. Those patients may also be at risk for DKA. Okay, so again, we just remind ourselves to change our headset. First and foremost, we look for diabetic emergencies. DKA is pretty common in type one, but type twos can have it. So you don't wanna close your mind off. Anybody who's got a wide gap and a positive beta hydroxybutyric acid can't just be the wide gap because wide gap could be hypovolemia. So you look for wide gap and a positive beta hydroxy, okay? Very, very important. And DKA typically occurs because we're not eating appropriately, but we're still taking insulin or because we have a secondary acute or critical illness. Typically you see this in more of the younger patient population and the mortality is quite low as long as you manage them well. And that's up to you as the bedside nurse. I mean, you're not writing the orders, but you're implementing them. The other glycemic emergency is HHS, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. Glucose is very high. The patient is passing glucose at the kidney, water is following, and the patient gets very dehydrated. Their volume is very contracted. So they're going to die from hypovolemic shock. So you're going to give them volume and you're going to start them on insulin and you're going to be cautious because you do not want to adjust the insulin too aggressively because they may have a precipitous drop in their glucose. Okay, so diagnostically, this is basic criteria. For DKA, typically your glucose is greater than 250. You have an acidotic pH. Your bicarb is down. Your ketones are positive. Your beta hydroxy is positive. Depends on how volume depleted you are, what your osmolarity is. You have a wide gap and you can have a variability of mental status. You may be totally awake and alert. You may be uptended. You might be unconscious or stuporous. HHS, typically glucose greater than 600. Arterial pH may be greater than 7.3. They may have a wide gap. So don't just say, oh, uh, when you look at the patient, you say, well, their glucose is 800, so they don't have a wide gap. You got to measure an anion gap. And you might consider a venous sample for blood gas lab, just so you have a good picture. But typically, as long as their glucose is less than 1,000, greater than 600, but less than 1,000, they will actually, uh, they'll do very, very well. First thing you're going to do is consider that they are probably eight to 10 liters down in fluid. So the very first thing you're gonna want to ask for is aggressive volume resuscitation. So typically that would be lactated ringers. It might be, in this case, you might use normal saline, although I wouldn't advise that. I'd advise lactated ringers and they're gonna get a lot of fluid. They're getting fluid because they've almost urinated themselves to death. And as you give them fluid, you're gonna dilute the glucose. So the glucose will start to come down and then we're gonna initiate insulin, okay? 
So for DKA, it's the acidosis that's life-threatening. So they're going to get fluid, insulin, insulin, glucose, and electrolytes. They have much less hypovolemia than the patient in HHS. Patient in HHS has life-threatening hypovolemia, and they have little to no acidosis, as long as the glucose is less than 1,000. You're going to give fluid, fluid, and insulin. Pretty straightforward. Pretty important. So now I want to look at everybody together, right? So for starvation ketosis, they're going to go, they're going to go physiologically to fatty acid metabolism. So they're going to have high ketones, but they really don't have acidosis and they don't have a fluid deficit and their blood glucose is normal. That's starvation ketosis. Alcoholic ketosis seen in chronic alcoholics, blood glucose is usually less than 250. If it's higher than that, they have some form of diabetes. They have positive ketones, but not nearly as significant as starvation ketosis. But they also have acidosis. So now you're going to look at their osm, and their osm is normal, so they don't have a fluid deficit. They're going to be withdrawing from alcohol. You're going to treat by your, your uh, methodology for treating alcohol withdrawal. And you may uh, consider putting them on insulin, but most likely you won't. Because just as you... Uh, treat them for alcohol withdrawal, you're going to see a reduction in the ketosis. Euglycemic DKA, that's seen in those patients. Remember the big three, Jardians, Farsica, and Ozempic. Patients who are receiving that, you will often see they'll present with euglycemic DKA. And they do it all the time in the intensive care unit as well. Okay, their blood glucose is less than 250. They're not hyperglycemic, but they have significant ketosis and significant acidosis. Before you actually evaluated them, they had some level of hyperglycemia. They wasted glucose, water followed. So they are typically two to four liters down. They need to get volume and they need to get insulin and they need to get glucose. With DKA, remember DKA is typically seen in younger patients more than in elderly patients. But elderly patients go on to develop complete insulin deficiency as well. And with DKA, or in if they're ketosis prone, diabetic type twos, their blood glucose typically 400 to 800, but we use 600 as a cutoff here. They have positive ketones, they have positive acidosis, and they have a fluid deficit of around six to eight liters. So at the same time that you're giving insulin, and you are giving glucose, you are also going to give fluid. So, and I'm gonna go all the way over here to HHS, which is a hyperglycemic emergency, typically occurs more in type twos and in elderly patients more than young, although that's not absolute. So don't get in your head, type ones are always gonna have DK and type twos are always gonna have HHS. Unfortunately, that's not true because type twos can have DK, type ones can have HHS. We're gonna make that determination by how high your glucose level is, okay? What's really important here is that you're not gonna have ketones. You may have acidosis, it may be lactic acidosis, but it's not gonna be beta hydroxy. And that's really what's gonna differentiate that patient. But that patient, 800 to 1200, 1500, 1700, they are eight to 10 liters down. So you really aren't gonna consider administration of insulin until you've given at least four liters of fluid. And you gotta do that fast because that patient has basically urinated themselves to death. They tend to be stuporous to comatose. You cannot evaluate them neurologically. Their glucose levels are really high, but remember here, you must not just rely on the anion gap telling you about acidosis. You must do a beta hydroxy on this patient. So we've really got to get the lab involved here. We've got to get them to respond to us quickly because that's really going to help to determine, do I treat this patient like they're DKA? Do I treat them like they're non-DKA? Or do I treat them like they're non-DKA in a hyperglycemic emergency, HHS. So that's a really important thing. So what we want to remember is our goal here is to treat anion gap and ketosis and to treat hyperglycemia and to treat hypovolemia. I'm sorry, that's not on your slide. Treat hypovolemia. 
Sometimes you're treating both hyperglycemia and ketosis. That's the patient who's in DKA. But remember, we also, and we are seeing more and more and more. It's happening more and more and more frequently. And we have to be sure that all of our colleagues understand if you are euglycemic with an increased beta hydroxy and you are wide anion gap, our goal is insulin and glucose. Glucose to match the insulin until I see the obliteration of your ketones, at which point you are gonna come off of your DKA protocol because you no longer have ketosis. And of course, our ultimate goal, which is incredibly and profoundly life-threatening is hypoglycemia. Avoid hypoglycemia. So two ways that we do that, or maybe more than two, be sure you're treating the right thing be sure that you are providing a glucose source. So for non-DKA, D5LR, 40 an hour. For DKA, if your blood glucose is less than 250, you should get D5LR at 150 an hour or D10 at 75 an hour. And for DKA, if your blood glucose is less than 150, you're gonna get D10 at 150 an hour until your ketones are gone. But if you fail here, and I'm just going to mention to you over the last week, I've just, I have spent such extraordinary time on glucomander and glucose management in my institution, because I have a whole bundle of new nurses who are being trained by their preceptors, not actually attending a real training, who are putting patients on insulin. So last night, patient got placed on continuous IV insulin with the blood glucose of 170. Okay, fine. And a gap of 18. Okay, fine. Euglycemic DKA. Okay. Patient didn't get a glucose store. No glucose at all. The doctor said, I don't believe in this and we're not going to give the patient glucose. So the patient plummeted to a blood glucose of 65 in an hour. Okay. I think, I'm not sure if it's Ashley who had the patient from last uh, Friday. I think that's this, Ashley, I'm not positive, but we had a patient on Friday who was a non-DKA patient and physician insisted, I'm an attending physician, you're gonna start this patient on 9.4 units of insulin and we're not gonna give glucose. And if the glucose comes down to 600 or 700, which means you're doing laboratory values because your point of care doesn't go greater than 600, you're doing lab values, which are two hours old, and that patient has a profound potential for hypoglycemia. That patient also got hypoglycemic. So we have a lot of battles. Our battle is really against disease. Our goal is to win against disease. Keep patients safe, get glucose under control, get ketones obliterated, and then transition to long-acting insulin. We have other barriers, and those barriers are that we have lots of new nurses, we're not getting trained properly to understand insulin and how dangerous insulin is because they don't do blood glucose on time and they don't understand the process of ketosis versus hyperglycemia. And in both cases, giving volume, making sure electrolytes are correct. And then we have physicians who are adamant about what they're doing, but sometimes don't have the bigger picture. So our job is really rich and abundant to do the right thing for the patient, to protect our patients at all costs from uh, utilization of insulin and uh, carbohydrate source that might be inappropriate. And then also to educate our physician colleagues in a really embracing way. And when you're having a lot of difficulty and they're adamant, making sure that you are actually reporting that in whatever way you do it. So here at Grady, uh, I'm very grateful that people have reported to me, but they've also put in RLs so that we can actually track and follow and uh, really create change because what we wanna do is the best for our patients when we are trying to implement glycemic management. Okay, so that's it, my friends, for today. I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm going to also stop recording. Thank you very much. Uh, for all of you on the line, please stay on the line. But for everybody who is looking at this on YouTube, thank you. Hope to see you again. Please partake of my 145 videos that are on my YouTube channel.
for whatever areas you're interested. Always happy to have feedback and requests. Thank you very much. Bye-bye for now.